Open your Bibles with me to James, the third chapter. James chapter 3. I've forgotten my phone, and I will need that because I have some quotes. So, I'd like to start off my sermon with a quote from renowned atheist Richard Dawkins. He says, there's actually two quotes from his book, The God Delusion. He says, Though the details differ across the world, no known culture lacks some version of the time-consuming, wealth-consuming, hostility-provoking rituals, the antifactual, counterproductive fantasies of religion. He later writes, When one person suffers from a delusion, it's called insanity. When many suffer from a delusion, it is called religion. Now, I don't want to talk about apologetics this morning, but I want to start with Richard Dawkins because he's got a rather interesting writing style. Uh, and a lot of people don't like him because what he writes is, uh, you know, counter to what we believe to be the truth, which I also agree with. But the thing that I don't particularly like about Richard Dawkins is that I don't find him very convincing. And the reason I don't find him convincing is because I don't actually think that he wants to be convincing. When you write like this, when you write to offend people, this isn't about a conversation. This is about making something that really sticks it in them, you know, really makes people angry. Richard Dawkins isn't all that interested in making a, a, a point. He wants to offend people, and that's what frustrates me about Richard Dawkins, and that's what frustrates me actually a lot about the way that people have conversations. Now, I'm going to quote for you some political things, not because I want to get political, but because I think that politics is also a phenomenal place to find examples of what I'm talking about here. Let me give you an example. This is something someone wrote about Donald Trump. Uh, this is, he was giving a speech about climate change, and they said that his speech was a break from centuries of enlightenment and rationality. The president presented his political statements as a nationalistic manifesto of the most imbecilic variety. Now, regardless of what you think about Trump, that's no way to talk about another person. And it's also not a way to have a conversation. Do you say that to make people angry, to get people riled up? To uh, speak from the other side, uh, here's a quote from a, a, com a like, well-respected political uh, conservative commentator. He said concerning uh, COVID stuff, we are a country of fearful, spineless invertebrates. Now, when you say that, you make it clear that you're not particularly interested in uh, convincing said fear, fearful, spineless invertebrates. You just want to make them angry. And I, I want to talk about this because this is not how we're supposed to have conversations. This is not how things get done. And so to now move to the biblical part of this, James 3 gives us a better way. In James 3, starting in verse 13, it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You read a passage like this, and it becomes immediately clear that there are people who speak and have disagreements like we're talking about here, in peaceful reasonable, gentle, meek ways, and there are people who don't. And guys, we cannot be, afford to be the people that don't, especially when it comes to religious matters. Because if we start offending people, not for the inherent offense of the gospel, but because we're just trying to be offensive or we're trying to like get mic drop moments on our opponents, then we're not going to save souls. We're not going to help people. And that's why it's critical that we understand James's wisdom from above. And so the wisdom from below 
he says, is, is motivated from selfishness. That you see a situation, you see a disagreement, and you want to take advantage of it to make other people look stupid and make yourself look smart and make all your followers go like, oh, whoa, he's so amazing. You want to, it's about you. It's not about the issues. It's not about the conversation. It's not about helping people. It's about you. And when we have conversations like this, we take God's good word and we make it about us. And we can't do that. On the opposing side, or on the other side, we have wisdom from above. Wisdom that God shows us how to converse and how to live our lives. Gentle, peaceable, reasonable. These are words that we need to remember. And when we get into arguments with people that make our blood boil, we have to hear that list in the back of our head. Peaceful. The, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Like, we've got to be peaceable. And so, I want to talk today, how do, how do we do this? How do we make sure that when we are having biblical discussions with people, that we do so from a place of wisdom from above and not wisdom from below? So, I've been taught in my sermon, Offense and Sensibility, which is obviously a little riff off of sense and sensibility, but offense, the thing that makes the wisdom from below uh, so offensive is that it, it's, not, it's intended to offend, it's not intended to help. But the wisdom from above, the wisdom from God, is reasonable, open to reason, it's sensible. And so these two types of wisdom are at competition, and we need to choose sensibility. And so uh, James lists like seven or eight different principles, and I have boiled them down generally to three that I think well represent what James is talking about, the things that represent a wisdom from above. And we'll start with where he starts, and that is that wisdom from above is first pure. And he'll also say at the end of this list that wisdom is sincere. That's the last thing he says in verse 17. And purity and sincerity are really hit at the same kind of point. That if we are trying to take God's word and bring it to people out in the world, and it's about God, and we're sincerely trying to serve God, then we're not going to talk like the people who are, you know, riling people up. We're going to talk like people who are focused on God and focused on helping get his word across the best way possible. To use, uh, you know, uh, to go back to our, our political example, you know, you could say, you know, if you wanted to tell people that, you know, COVID, we need to, you know, cool it about COVID, you could say, guys, you know, it, it's not as bad as we thought, it's going to be okay, it's reassuring, it's helpful, it's focused on the issue, but you know, we're a country of spineless, like, that, that's not helpful. That just gets people mad. It's just about making a point. And we can see that so clearly when we look at political discourse. But when we get into biblical discourse, sometimes we just, like, lose our minds. And, like, I, I've sat through so many apologetics classes that the point of the class seems to be, like, how we can dunk on all the atheists, like, how we can, you know, all the, all the things that we can say that are really going to trip them up, and, I, you know, I, I'm not an atheist. I think there are good reasons not to be an atheist, but there's a difference in saying, hey, you know, can we talk about this? I don't think that, you know, this is, this is really the best way of looking at it, and being like, oh, well, you think that? Well, uh, you're an idiot. Like, no, <laughs> you know, we, we say things... Uh, like, when people start talking about evolution, you know, we're trained to be like, oh, well, where are all the transition fossils then? <laughs> or, uh, you know, we talk about uh, ethics that come from uh, an objective source. And we, you know, we look at people out in the world like, oh, well, you don't believe in God? Well, you probably think that eating babies for breakfast is okay, you savage. Like, you know, and that's a little bit of an exaggeration. But you understand what I'm saying here, that when we talk like this, we're not communicating. We're not talking about God's word. We're making it about us. We're making it about making other people look stupid. And that's not how we have conversations. And so let me show you uh, both a positive and a negative example of purity, of communication and wisdom that is sincerely focused on God, sincerely focused on doing God's will. So we'll start with a negative example, and that's in Philippians 1. So Paul says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. 
The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Note, uh, I've underlined four different terms here, envy, rivalry, selfish ambition, and not sincerely. And you'll notice that those are words that are also found, or at least concepts found in James, to describe either the wisdom from below, or uh, to, to say that this is not what the wisdom from above is like. And so we see that these uh, teachers, I don't want to call them false teachers, because Paul makes it clear that they are, they're preaching the gospel. He says, you know, uh, in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. So it seems like the gospel is getting preached by these people, but uh, we'll call them selfish teachers, because they're not doing it for God. They're doing it from selfish ambition, not sincerely. And what exactly it is that they're doing is a little bit unclear. Paul doesn't clarify. I assume the Philippians knew. But, I mean, we can think of a lot of, of potential uh, for what this might be. Uh, you can think about I know this is a, a little bit of, of a different kind of thing, but Ananias and Sapphira, for example, they came and they, they gave and claimed that it was all they had. Well, why did they do that? I mean, you can look just before that. That's what Barnabas did. He brought all his money to the apostles from the sale of his property. He said, uh, you know, this, I want, I want to give this to the poor. And probably people heard about that. Probably people were like, yo, Barnabas, he's like a really cool guy. And Barnabas didn't give it so that everyone would think that he was awesome, but people heard about it. And Ananias and Phyra, they, they could hear about that. They could hear the story. Be like, oh, well, if Barnabas got uh, famous from this, then you know, maybe we can, we can get in on this. They're trying to use God. They're trying to use the things of God to advance themselves. I mean, you can see this in, in preaching. You know, people who, who get a pulpit just to talk about uh, whatever their high horse is. Or, you know, we can have this same sort of thing when we're talking to other people. I mean, we talked about apologetics earlier. We're just trying to trip up other people, and uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to take situations and make them about us that don't need to be about us. Because when we're discussing the things of God, it should be about God. I mean, that's, that's not complicated. And when we lose the sincerity, uh, when it's swallowed up by selfish ambition, then we, we get distracted and we take the things of God, we preach, we share God's word, but it, it's not from a heart that it ought to be from. Well, let me show you a positive example. Uh, and this one shouldn't be hard to think of. I'm going to Jesus in uh, John chapter 6. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And you can see that in Jesus' life. A consistency that everything Jesus did had God's will in mind. Even to the end, you know, in the garden, he prayed, you know, let this come past me. Like, Jesus like, I don't want to do this, but not my will, but your will be done. That Jesus wanted to serve God through his whole life. And yeah, Jesus did some things that uh, offended some people. But he wasn't doing them to offend people. He was doing them because he needed to share the gospel. And we also need to be aware that as we are going out in the world, that we might not always be received well. But let that not be because we were selfishly peddling God's word to you know, claim our own glory and make other people look stupid. But we were sharing God's word from a pure heart, sharing God's word with a sincere love for people. I want to look also in 1 Corinthians. Uh, I think Paul is an excellent example of someone who's preaching God's word purely. This is 1 Corinthians. We'll read the first uh, five verses of chapter 2. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 5, And I... When I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God." Paul says, yeah, I could have come in here and like blasted you all with some like crazy rhetoric and you would have thought I was the greatest speaker ever. But I didn't do that because it's not about me. Like I'm here to share 
God with you. And so he spoke in a way that the power of God might come through because it wasn't about Paul. I mean, you can see uh, he talks this way similarly in chapter 4. He talks about how uh, the apostles were the last of all men. They're, you know, scum of the earth, a refuse of all things. Like, that's what Paul thought of himself because he didn't care what people thought about him. He didn't care about taking advantage of God's word for his own power. He was there to serve God, to tell people about the Lord. That was his care. That's what he wanted to do. And if we are out there sharing God's word with that sort of purity and sincerity, then we're going to go a long way in sharing God's word with a wisdom from above and not from a wisdom below. And so how do we, how do we make sure that we're doing this? I, I think it becomes incredibly apparent when you look at suffering in our lives and in the lives of people who shared the God's word with purity. I mean, you think about Jesus, think about Paul. Like, they suffered a lot for God's word. They were okay being the scum of the earth because that, well, it wasn't about that for them. It was about serving God. Whereas these people in, in Philippians, they were obviously doing this from selfish motives, and they weren't the ones suffering. They made other people suffer. And so when we're out there in the world— um, sharing God's word, or when we're among each other sharing God's word, um, what happens when we're wrong? Or what happens when we're persecuted for the things that we're sharing? Do we get more intent, or do we, do we back off? Because that's going to be a, a point for us to note, that if it's about us, we're not going to be as eager when things get difficult. But if it's about God, then we keep pushing. Or here's another way to think about it. Um, Paul says he's the, the scum of all things. Like, uh, are you okay to be, you know, the, the equivalent of, you know, the s stuff you, you push off your boot? Like, is, are, you, can, are you happy to be a stepping stone for God? Or do you need notoriety? Do you need to be, like, out in front so people are like, oh, yeah, he's great? Because, again, that's going to be an, an obvious sign that if it's not about God, if it's about you and you're not content to serve God when things get difficult— then this should be a sign to you that you're not serving God from pure motives, that instead there's some sort of selfish ambition going on. And so let's go back to James 3. We're going to read verses 16 and 17 again. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and of good fruits, impartial and sincere. This is the kind of wisdom we have to have. And so, first, the wisdom of God is pure. And then, in uh, James's list, as well as mine, the wisdom is peaceable. Uh, and with, when I say peaceable, I would like to grab some of the other things he says. Um, he says that the wisdom of God is peaceable, he adds, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy. He says, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. He says in uh, verse 13 that, we're, that the meekness of wisdom is how we show uh, that we're, we're serving God and that we have uh, wisdom. That there were people out there, when they argue, they go for blood. They're trying to offend people. I mean, we looked at, looked at those examples in the first, you know, bring back, you know, another one. You don't tell, you don't say that someone's ideas are, you know, imbecilic if you're interested in, you know, making friends with them or, like, talking about the issues. No, you say that because you want to offend somebody. And when people fight like that, it doesn't lead to reconciliation. It doesn't lead to bridges being built. Instead, it just makes people mad. It's not gentle. It's not open to reason. It's certainly not meek or peaceable. We've got to be people who, when we talk about the things of God, they're peaceable. Um, let me give you a positive ex or a negative example first. Nope. Uh, I have a friend, someone I know personally, actually, and uh, I lost a lot of respect for them when I was following them on Facebook, and um, so they posted this thing about evolution, which, again, I also don't believe in evolution. But they posted this thing about evolution and uh, why, it was, why it was wrong and stupid. And uh, so their friend comments on it. And they're like, they seem to be pro-evolutionist. And 
my friend, the person that I know, the person that I, I, I thought was like a pretty solid person, writes, you're an idiot. Then, so, one more topic goes by on which Greg knows nothing. But he keeps opening his mouth sad. And I was like, why are you going to talk like that to him? Like, there, there is no reason to have conversations like that. There's no reason to r- ramp up the anger and the hostility in the conversation. We got to be the kinds of people who, when we talk about the things of God, when we talk about the truth of God, that we do it in a way that is gentle and kind. And yeah, people are going to be wrong sometimes. I mean, we've talked about this, you know, enough with apologetics already. But like, even among us, there are going to be people who are ignorant. There are people going to be people who are still growing, and people who are just going to be straight up wrong. And when we come, when we converse with them, when we talk to them, it needs to be from a place of gentleness. I mean, that's what Paul says in Galatians six. He says, uh, in the spirit of gentleness, restore such a one. Or uh, Paul, again, in 2 Thessalonians, he says, uh, don't, ad- don't view him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Like, when we are working with one another, there are going to be times where we disagree. There are going to be times where things get rough. And in that moment, you've got to make a choice. Are we going to let things get ugly, or are we going to be peaceable, gentle, and meek? Because that's what the wisdom from above does. Let me show you an example of this in Acts chapter 18. Acts 18, this is the story of Aquila and Priscilla correcting Apollos. In Acts 18, verses 24 through 28, it says, Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man competent in the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogues, but when when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. When he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Now, as a kid, I really, this, this verse vexed me. Because I guess I was raised as more of a Bible beater than I realized. And um, this just it seemed like the wrong reaction. Like, Apollos is speaking something, and it's clearly not true. Like, shouldn't they have, like, gotten up and, like, yelled and caused a ruckus and, you know, called him mean names and said, ah, it's lies, it's false teaching. They didn't do that. What they did instead is they waited, and they, they pulled him aside. And they said, hey, Apollos, um, there's some things you don't know, and uh, let's talk about that. And when they did that, when they chose to do this gently and kindly, I mean, they could have made Apollos mad. They could have assumed the worst. I mean, obviously, this guy, although he's teaching uh, something that's not quite right, he's, he's a sincere dude. And if they had just assumed the worst about him and gotten all up in arms, they would have easily made an enemy of Apollos. But they didn't do that. Instead, they were kind. They were, gen- they were gentle. And when they talked to him, he listened And then he became a great asset to the church. They sent him on to Achaia, and he strengthened people, and he refuted Jews. I mean, he became something, someone really, really helpful. And the reason that he was able to do that is because they chose gentleness instead of hostility. They chose to be peaceable instead of offensive. And that's the kind of choices we have to make. Now, I want to say, as we we talk about this, and I, I hinted at this a bit earlier, the Bible is inherently offensive sometimes. I mean, if you tell somebody who's living in an adulterous marriage that God thinks their marriage is adulterous, like, it doesn't matter how gently you tell them that, they're going to get upset. And, uh, like, I, I would like to acknowledge that as we share God's word, there are parts of it that are inherently offensive. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't preach those things. But what I'm saying is, When people get upset at the offensiveness of the gospel, don't let it be because you did a terrible job sharing it. Like, don't let it be uh, that you brought a militaristic interpretation to it that offended people. Rather, 
Share God's word with peace, with gentleness, with meekness. And if they get upset, it's not you that they're upset at. It's God's word. And in those cases, you can have, have peace in yourself that you did your job correctly with wisdom from above. But otherwise, we're going to turn people off, and it's, it's not, not going to work the way it should. So we have to choose peace. Uh, let's read our text again. We keep centering back on here. James 3, starting in verse 13 this time. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, don't boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So he said, the wisdom from above, it's pure. It's focused sincerely on God, and it's peaceable. It's not going to offend people unnecessarily. But finally, I want to show you that the peace of God, or the wisdom from above, is productive. Uh, this is seen in, at the end of verse 17, that uh, it's full of mercy and of good fruits. That uh, God's word bears good fruits. And then in verse 18, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That when we choose this avenue of, of serving God with wisdom from above, that it's going to produce good things. Now contrast that with the wisdom from, from below, which is characterized by uh, every vile practice, uh, disorder. And you could uh, look up a little bit earlier in James 3, this is talking about the tongue, and specifically a tongue that seems to be uh, out of control. And it says in verse 8, that no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. So a tongue that is out of control is full of deadly poison. But the, the Wisdom from above is full of good fruits. The tongue, when out of control, it destroys things. It sets fire to things. That's what it says in verse 6. And yet, we are here to build things, to produce and to push the, wisdom, uh, the, the cause of Christ on in this world, not to tear down the kinds of things that God worked to build. Let me show you what I'm talking about. In Romans chapter 14, this is talking about uh, matters of disagreement. It says, so let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything indeed is clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. What Paul says here is very specific. He says, guys, there are going to be things that you disagree about. And uh, you might even be right in when you disagree with somebody. And yet, there are times in which the way that you pursue this issue, uh, when it, it becomes apparent, it's no longer about the truth and about God, it's about you and about the things that you want. He says, Don't, do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God, that God is doing something good. He is you know, bringing together people from all over. He's, he's made a church. And when you push your liberties to the point that you threaten the unity of the church, that that doesn't come from peace. That doesn't come from wisdom from above. It doesn't come from a love for God. It comes from selfishness because you are destroying the work of God. Uh, I mean, we can, we can look around in the world right now. And uh, you know, there are a lot of denominations out there, a lot of different groups, and they divide over, like, lots and lots and lots of things. And, you know, here, to, to use this example, and I'll just, you know, to, to grant for the sake of argument that uh, Paul is, in this text, allowing drinking wine. Uh, what that would look like in this church is that there are people here who are arguing, and Paul would say correctly, for the sake of our argument, that it's okay to drink wine but that they are pushing it to such a point, they're pushing this liberty to such a point that they are endangering the unity of the church. And sure, 
Maybe there is some legitimate Bible study that goes into learning about the truth. But when you are pushing your liberty to, this, to the extent that you are threatening the unity of the church, then that, that's, not, that's not about wisdom. That's not about truth. That's not about God. That's about you. And we've got to be aware that even when we're preaching the truth, even when we're trying to do what's right, that we've got to do it from a spirit of selflessness. Because if we let selfish ambition come in, we can create a lot of fissures that are going to not help, not produce good things, but hinder God's work. I'll show you the flip side of this. Ephesians 2, this is Paul talking to the Ephesians. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore killing the hostility. Paul is bringing what, again, could be a potentially... uh, divisive message, and that is that the Gentiles are part of God's uh, work, and I mean, it definitely caused a lot of ripples in the first century church, but Paul is teaching it uh, from sincerity, from excitement about what God is doing in the world, and the goal that Paul has is the goal about what he's teaching, that they could be one, that the wall of hostility would be broken down, that these things that keep Jew and Gentile apart could be put aside and that they could work together. That's what Paul wants, is Jew and Gentile, just as God intended, to be one body. And if that's what we're focused on, if we're trying to make God's will happen, if we're trying to bring the people of God together, if we're trying to make it easier for people to follow God, then like that's, that's the wisdom from above. That's us pursuing what God wants, producing the right things with the right kind of wisdom. Acts 13, same sort of thing. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of God, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. This shows the, the fruit of, after Paul teaches, that, that people get excited, and that it, it produces people wanting to come to the Lord. And when we speak, we got to make sure that we are bringing people to God, not putting up barriers that keep them from him. That we are making it easier for people to follow God Uh, and and not more difficult, that we are making people excited about God, make them love God, make them love his truth, rather than creating divisions. So we step back and we say, how do we do this? What, what What are we doing in our lives? Two wisdoms, a wisdom that is fundamentally from selfishness, from our own desires, That's not going to fly. That's not going to help us spread the gospel. It's only going to hurt things. It's only going to tear down. And then there's another wisdom, a better way, a wisdom from above that is gentle, that is peaceable, open to reason, sincere. And that's the kind of wisdom we need to pursue, a wisdom that is purely focused on God, that my life is is not important. I'm not using these as opportunities to advance myself. I just want to serve God. A wisdom that is peaceable, that doesn't offend people if you don't have to. It goes to great lengths to not offend people if you don't have to. Because we're trying the best we can to share God's word in a kind, gentle, meek, reasonable way. And finally, a, a wisdom that is productive, that builds things, that advances the cause of Christ rather than tearing it down. So what do we do? What do we do? How do we apply this? Well, we don't make it about ourselves. You know, it's, there's too many temptations that to, to make it about us. Don't let it do that. And what do we do? I mean, we, we got to stand for truth. we got to be resolute. I mean, one of these attributes is that the wisdom from above is impartial, that it's sincere. Like, we are trying to tell the world about Jesus, and we're going to disagree with people, and that is okay. But when we disagree, disagreeing for the Lord does not look like yelling, It doesn't look like name-calling. It doesn't look like insinuating that we're better than them somehow. It looks like a man who died on a cross for the sins of his people. It looks like a good shepherd. It looks like someone who left the 99 
to go after the one. It looks like the, our teacher, our Jesus, who said to forgive 70 times 7. That's the kind of wisdom, that's the kind of servant that God wants us to be. Would you pray with me about that? Our God, help us to have an undivided mind. Let us not be double-minded serving ourselves and you, but help us to be pure in our focus, sincere in the way we carry the Bible. Help us to be peacemakers, to listen, to help, and guide, to gently correct. Help us to be firm in our convictions and gentle in our reproof. Help us to put our cares behind us and to build up your cause. Help us to swallow our pride, to turn off the noise and the rhetoric of this world, and to pursue your will with purity, peace, and productivity so that your cause can advance and that we can play our little part in your kingdom. Make us like your son, in whose name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing a song here in a moment. Uh, it's meant to encourage you, and I hope that if, if there's anything we can do for you, if you have some storms going on in your life, some, some troubles, some sin that you would like the prayers of the congregation for, we would love to help you. Or if you've never begun your journey, being baptized into Christ, to start following him and pursuing that plan of life, we would love to help you with that. Whatever your need, please come as we stand and sing.